I'm here with Dean Eingenmann and Corey Petty of Status, and we're going to talk about a number of things. One thing that uh, that I'm really excited about and uh, that you know, happened recently is that Status came out uh, a, a, as a as a 1.0 on the App Store. Uh, we we've been waiting to, for this for a long time. The the the, the, the uh, anticipation was growing, and then finally it, it dropped. I, I I opened up my iPhone one day, and there it was. Um, and so we'll we'll talk about that, but we'll also talk about some of the uh, underlying technologies um, that uh, power uh, that make Status. Uh, possible and sort of the you know, ecosystem of technologies that uh, are being built by the Status Organization, otherwise known as the Status Network. Uh, so thanks for joining me today, guys. Thanks for having thanks us. For having us. So let's let's talk about this this, this launch. Um, first, congratulations on on launching the app. Um, you know, walk walk me through a little bit of the uh, uh, you know the, the the weeks leading up to the launch. Um, what were some of the challenges that you guys were facing i've heard that there's been some issues sort of getting this through the app store or this sort of thing is, is that right like were there some some uh some barriers there or was it more technical or? i guess there's a a myriad of things right like we started out as this like interface to the three prongs of ethereum you have decentralized messaging decentralized storage and in the blockchain and we wanted to provide that and uh in the process of doing it we realized we had to double back and build a lot of infrastructure that didn't exist, which then prolonged a lot of this stuff, like perpetual, it'll be soon, it'll be soon, it'll be soon, until we finally got to a point where we think it, we think it's at a, it's a reasonable state, like a foundation, right, to actually push into the app store and get it in people's hands. Then, as you, as you should do with any type of product that holds value for, for users, we got an audit for it. Mm -hmm. uh, and going through a lot of those issues even pushed it back further because this thing, one, one like small things turn into larger things in the process of trying to fix them. Uh, and then you want to constantly think about how do we simultaneously make good like default decisions for users, but then give them options to change them when they want to. Mm. And so, and then doing all of that in a way that's intuitive and useful to give them an experience that's, I guess, on par with any type of regular messaging app because we try to onboard someone who's not into crypto or not into this stuff and they pick it up and they're like, why is this so slow? Or why did this act the way I think it, think it should act? And it's like, well, it's everything underneath it works differently, but we can't show you that. So it, it, it was a difficult process trying to figure out what's the thing we're happy with. Cause there's so many other things we want to do down the future or like down the line uh, that need to build off of it. And we finally got to a point across the organization where we're like, okay, we got it. Now let's push it out and start to iterate on, on that thing. And what's the reaction been since uh, since it came out? So far, uh, we've been we've been quite happy with the users who have downloaded it, used it, given us feedback. Everyone seems to be pretty happy with like the overall user flow, what it can do uh, relative to like other wallets. I guess it's it's different in my opinion because most other products that are similar are only a slice of what you can do with crypto. They're either a wallet and potentially maybe a DApp browser. They're a chat messenger. Uh, they're only a wallet to store your crypto. They're, or they're only a DApp browser. It's so like we try to provide all of it together. And I think that's a new type of application for people in this space to start playing around with. That's also, hopefully, really useful for people outside the space. So it's, it's easier to onboard somebody because you can say, hey, download this chat app. It's, it's a secure way to talk to me. And also you can do these other things that you may want to do later on down the line. Mm. So I'd like to ask you about the relationship, I guess, with, with app platforms, um, maybe less so Google, but more so Apple. You know, there, there have been murmurs in the space that uh, applications with built-in DApp browsers ha have you know, struggled to, to get onto the App Store. And, uh, you know, I was, I was talking with uh, Jason Goldberg earlier of Pepo, and, you know, he was telling me about uh, the, the conversations that he had with Apple to um, educate them about what they were doing and then finally approving, getting the app approved and, you know, to be honest, I was like, I want to say, I don't want to say skeptical, but I, I, you know, I thought maybe it, it wouldn't get through or you guys would have a challenge getting the app through with the, the DAP browser in there because they've been so seemingly reluctant to uh, let apps through. Talk a little bit about that. Am I right in assuming that that's a sort of touchy subject with Apple? Or? We were worried about that. Uh, and I think depending upon when we decided to release, we could have had like differentiated results from Apple. 
Uh, luckily, we had zero pushback whatsoever. Uh, when we when we pushed the application or like submitted it to them for review, it was almost immediately approved. Uh, and I think that maybe had to do with the timing in which we did it. Uh, they weren't looking at it. They did, we they didn't see us. We we had been in test flight for such a long time that since it was similar under the same kind of app ID, they just like okay, they're finally pushing to V1. It's fine. They were in test flight. It should be should be okay. But I think we were really lucky uh, that um, either they've changed their policy when we decided to release, or they we just didn't have the attention from them because that's not something we can really control. We can't take that out. We can't rip that part out of the of the application and still say we're status. So we'll see how things go. We definitely monitor it and hope that they continue to have some somewhat of like a open policy on on applications like like anything with a wallet. Yeah, any DeFi app really. Yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah. I think the one place we had an issue was China. Yep. If I remember correctly. Yeah. So I think I think there was an issue with uh, releasing the application in China. I can't speak to details on it because they're not they're not strongly in my head, but. It's, it's one of those situations where if we can't find a way to do that, then we'll find a way to get the software to people who want it uh, so they, they can get access to it and join the network if they, if they, if they want to. That's kind of the whole goal because like, we don't want to be constrained to any specific channel of distribution. As long as people can get the application and prove that they got a valid source of it and then educational material on they can, how to do that type of stuff, then, then we're happy because... I guess that's one of the situations that Status is always going to be in is proprietary platforms like Apple force you to use specific types of protocols that give away various amounts of metadata or information about the users who are using it. For instance, push notifications is one of those. It's very difficult for us to use push notifications on Apple. In the process of doing so, we told Apple a lot about our users, who's using it, who's talking to whom, things like that. And it's against our policies and principles. So. Like we have to find alternative methods to do push notifications or not have them, which is a virely like suffering consequence to the end users because they're so used to it. Mm. Yeah, I guess the, the issue with, with China would probably be the, different than the issue here, whereas you know, here I think the issue is more about um, allowing people to leverage DeFi and so you know, Apple not getting sort of a piece of that yeah. transaction uh, fee or, or so, uh, of that transaction uh, but it, but in China it's probably more around around sort of censorship and and um, yeah, I think it, yeah. the problem in China was something about encryption. Yeah, most likely. Yeah. And that's a big thing with a lot of I guess uh, large nation like national actors having issues with um, applications that don't have ways in which they can seize an object and see the source material, and like and, and then they're in, in some cases going to the developers and asking them to put back doors and things, and that's just like one of those situations that. One, due to our principles, we'll never do. Two, even if we did, you can see it because everything's open source. Right. That may be a problem we have to face in the future. Say if we have like uh, some threshold of, of success, people coming after us trying to get those things done and find and potentially finding alternative ways of distribution. Like, hmm. so what are the what are some of the core features in, in V1, and you know what's what's in the pipe uh, for for future versions? Can you talk a little bit about the roadmap? I can start with like where it is now. Yeah. Uh, Dean can tell you about a lot of the kind of uh, protocol level advancements where we're, we're looking at to make scaling um, a lot better. But um, as it stands today, it's 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 an application, mobile application put on your phone. Eventually, we'll have other hardware applications like desktop and 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 web and things like that. Um, it's a mobile DAP browser, so you know, do your DeFi, do any any type of Web three application. It's a it's a browser and a Web three application, a Web three browser, uh, and of course, if it's a Web three browser, there's an associated wallet where you get to manage your private keys, look at your uh, online assets for Ethereum. Ethereum based as is assets for now remains to be seen if we start adding other chains or the ability to use it on on different on different networks. And, and then a chat application. So uh, the ability to coordinate um, all of this value transaction within a chat context. So public chats and um, end-to-end -end encrypted private chats, which is uh, done using the signal protocol of open whisper systems on top of Whisper, which was the uh, original messaging system of, of Ethereum. With regards to <clears throat> the, the sort of chat experience, um, you know, there there are obviously you can like do one 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 on one chatting. Uh, you can also do there are also groups. 
uh, these are public. Um, are there any plans to, to have different types of communication channels, like perhaps private groups? Or the reason I'm asking is like I, um, I I'm off, I'm often appalled to see the entire crypto space on Telegram, uh, just because like okay the data is encrypted but all of it sits on Telegram servers, and I, I find that the use of Telegram very much goes against the sort of ethos of, of crypto right of like own your data own your keys own this and that right and uh, I I would really love to see. Um, the space start moving toward like dog fooding, right? Like using tools that that actually like are being built by the space and 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 sort of adhere to the principles of what everyone here is building. Um, and and for that, you know, I think status needs to evolve. There needs to be like m more features and things like this. So, um, with regards to sort of onboarding the crypto space, um, what do you see as the 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 most pressing features that that it needs to add? Yeah, I guess I, I only mentioned the, the things that are currently enabled in the app. Uh, and that is that is like public chats, which have a modicum of privacy in them that's a little more advanced, but uh, and then private like private one to one chats. We also have private group chats that's I think as of yesterday oh, okay. um, <laughs> is finished. We had it disabled within the application so that we can have uh, some a few like user experience issues fixed. But it's uh, it needs to be that'll 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 provide private group chats, but only to a certain number of people, because the way it's implemented doesn't scale. Much like kind of what uh, Signal has been talking about with their beta program. Uh, Signal has a has a, has a new beta uh, private group chat that will scale a lot better. Ours will be like we're looking for implementations that'll scale just as well, but also decentralized in terms of where those messages go. Um, something I didn't mention about the application is that you can send you can send assets inside the chat context. So we can be talking. You say, "Hey, how much was lunch? It's this. Okay, do you take you know ETH here? You can have that, right?" Well, we can also do uh, incentivized or access restricted channels in terms of you can only enter into this chat given you have some specific requirements uh, on chain. And you can prove that in various various methods. So we'll have like things like Tribute Talker. You can only contact me if you pay a certain fee. So influencers can monetize that that audience or something like that. And there's a lot of other things we can do, which we're thinking about, but have yet to be fleshed out fully. Uh, yeah, I think Corey kind of mentioned everything. The the with, with the group chat problem is like the reason why Signal can solve it right now or has this new beta program is because they use centralized servers. So group chats in this peer-to-peer -peer context are really hard because what ends up happening essentially is I'm sending the message to everyone and I'm encrypting the message for everyone. So that has a huge overhead. When, when there's 100 people in this group chat, I need to send the message 100 times. I need to have it encrypted 100 times and I need to resend it up until it's been received by 100 people, which is just not manageable. So also one of the bigger issues with, with group chats in this space is um, private or access who actually has access to the group like we can't modify a group chat to remove people because there's no guarantee that that remove um, event was propagated throughout the entire network so that everyone knows that for example Corey's been removed from a group chat so he could still be eavesdropping in the group chat without everyone knowing it, it just requires one party to forget and he'd still be within the entire conversation interesting how are, how are you mitigating that? So that, that seems like a, an interesting design challenge there. Well, right now, as said, there's no removal feature. There, there no, no, the group chats, I mean. With um, sending it to... Yeah, scaling scaling group chats. As said, right now, there's the limit of how big a group chat can be. Okay. We, we use these end nodes, which store messages, where, uh, where users then go to download the messages once they come online again. Mm -hmm. The problem, though, is that that has a certain metadata leakage, which we don't like, because what ends up happening is a user or a server finds out what a user is interested in because the user has to reveal this to get the messages that are meant for them synchronized onto their phone. Interesting, okay. I'd like to come back maybe to um, a, a bit more of the sort of like e the experience around, around, around status. 
And I, I would love to see Status sort of grow uh, as the as a dominant uh, messaging platform in, in the crypto space, and then yeah, beyond the crypto space, of course. But um, what kind of thinking are you guys doing around things like the interesting kind of di uh, uh, yeah product product features that uh, crypto enables, like you know content monetization and, and things like that? I mean, are, are those the types of things that you're thinking about in status or is it mostly just staying at the messaging layer or are there sort of more like social features, content uh, monetization features and, and this sort of thing that we can foresee in, in future versions of status? So one of the things that's like is currently implemented and we'll be rolling out like, I guess some more robust or a more expanded feature feature is the, the sticker market. Um, I guess all, all popular messages messengers, have realized that stickers are incredibly popular with their users. If you look at Line, that's their main source of revenue. Yeah. Um, but once again, that's a, like it's, it's this like under control and censored by a specific authority, and they take all of the benefit. Like people can make stickers, they may get a, a fraction of the profits of offering that sticker to the community, but the company makes makes all that money. So we created the sticker market as an open market of NFTs. So. Um, eventually when we open it up right now it's under our control we flip a switch and it becomes completely open uh, any creator will be able to create a sticker pack offer it up on an open market and then set that revenue to themselves or donate it to someone else mm. and potentially there's a couple tweaks in there you can you can choose to send a portion of it to the status network as, as well uh, and then people and those are both like those are both nfts so owning the the sticker pack is an NFT in itself, which can be traded. So if you have scarcity around how many of those things can be bought, you can then trade that in some market, as well as the uh, beneficiary is also an NFT. So who receives the funds when someone buys a sticker pack is also an NFT. And so that becomes this nice kind of open market that anyone can participate in to give a feature in a, in a messenger app that everyone actually ends up liking, right? And so that could be, that could be one kind of uh, example of things you can do socially in these things and then and then it's a lot of like coordination around all of the potential decentralized applications that are being made right what, what, what lacks i think in a lot of the space now is i built this dap how do i build the community around it how do i build people to talk about it while they're using it things like that and so like one of the features in in, in the dap browser is while i'm on a dap i can just push chat and it takes you to the de a deterministic chat room uh, dedicated that to that DAP so people can coordinate around it. Right. And trying to build things around that coordination, I think, is really important. Okay, so you're seeing this as more like a level of abstraction above, um, but that sits outside of status, but that sits in a DAP, but that interacts with status. I mean, so as as a content producer, the the types of things that are interesting to me in, in, for status is, um, you know, having the ability to u leverage status as a place where I can I can grow a community. And, you know, we we're also talking about this with with Peppo earlier, um, uh, not, not to like uh, um, and push all of my sponsors, but like <laughs> you guys are sponsors, Peppo are sponsors. But but I think there's interesting there's interesting dynamics here and, and, and sort of overlapping uh, 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 conversations. But one of the things that I think would be interesting in status is the ability to create a community, right? Like you see on Telegram, like there's communities out there with, you know, hundreds of thousands of people in there. And there are people in there that are creating a lot of value for those communities. Some are not, and it would be great to have a, a, a kind of mechanism by which um, you know people would be able to uh, um, accrue value from monetary value, uh, financial value from creating value for the community. So if I'm posting good content, then like people can easily uh, uh, you know send me tokens uh, of appreciation, and uh, and and then that that content sort of. Uh, percolates to the top, and um, and then the rest, you know, maybe um, not so much, right? Like, uh, I think there's interesting kind of social opportunities here um, for for the crypto space. So, I think you can yeah. think of us as like infrastructure for community building in a lot of ways. Like, when you have all three of those things, you can you can provide a way for people to come together and build communities and interact with them. Because, like, I mean, I I, I produce like content as well, and I would agree with you that the there's a gap between the content producer and the people who consume it. Mm -hmm. uh, we hope, I hope personally, to build uh, to build things within the status ecosystem that like close that gap significantly, so that not only are they participating in helping in the creation of that content, but potentially being rewarded in various ways. 
So you have like a much stronger relationship between the people who create things and the people who consume it across the board, not just for podcasts, but for whatever. I think crypto enables us to do that, but I don't know what it looks like yet. So we're trying to provide, like, provide infrastructure for experimentation within that, right? So let's um, let's talk about some of that infrastructure. Uh, you mentioned the the VAC P2P protocol. Um, can you explain um, what that is and how uh, how it improves upon like Whisper? Yeah. So so VAC is the research group where we do a bunch of different research right now focused on messaging. Um, we we created a fork of Whisper which improves upon all these things. So. From our very theoretical model, we're able to scale it far further than um, it currently scales. So in the next iteration, currently we estimate with this theoretical model that we can support like a thousand users. With our with VAC or with the research we're doing at VAC, we can probably scale it to around 10,000 users. So that that's through, really interestingly, a lot of it has been through s small tweaks but we're able to see that like w with some of these small tweaks, we can like expand the user base quite a bit of what we'll be able to support in the future. There's some other, I guess, experimental stuff that we're looking into. So like that's, the, I mean, th that getting into that, those numbers is within a very short timeline of things we know we can do that makes sense, that don't compromise our principles uh, to get to a, like a, a much larger user base that's reasonable for smaller communities. And then there's a bunch of other things that we're looking into to drastically improve that so we can get to like those much, much larger communities, right? Because like you can't compete with Telegram if you can't support the people who use Telegram yeah. or, or Signal or any other, any other like, like messaging application. And, and with every scaling thing that we introduce, we essentially have a privacy trade-off that we need to discuss. Potentially, yeah. yeah. So as I said, like we store messages on a server or on various nodes that users pull from. There's a trade-off there because you're losing out on some metadata protection. Mm. All, there's light nodes. If you have a, if you're on a mobile phone and you're a light node, then a user or an, a server that relays or a node that relays your messages can kind of figure out um, what you're sending, you know, or um, which messages originate from where and can start attributing things like that. So. We, we're, we're very cautious on building these scaling solutions, but also like seeing where the trade-offs are at so that we don't sacrifice too much privacy. I guess in my, in my personal, personal view, based on what Dean just said, it's, it's I don't think we're ever going to get away from having to use specific types of technologies that leak metadata or like compromise in security or privacy. And so the goal is to provide all of the options um, and allow the user to choose what he needs based on what he feels he's like, right? Like it's 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 always going to be a trade-off. If I if I want to go to participate in something like that, it may mean I and I and I want to maintain my privacy and security to a certain level. It may mean I make a trade-off in bandwidth and computation. So we're going to provide you with those options so that you can conduct yourself the way you'd like to, while still participating in the community. So, because in some contexts, like when you're you know uh, spamming a troll box. You don't care, right? You don't care what's what's leaked or not because you're, you're it's a throwaway account or something like that. And so we'd like to be able to provide those options while also having like incredibly secure peer-to-peer -peer communications where you don't have to worry about what happens if someone finds those messages. They don't have a, an ability to figure out any information from them. And that's, in, in reality, I think just based on the way computers work, that's the only thing we can do is just build appropriate infrastructure and the protocols for communicating and then give the end user the option to conduct themselves the way they want to. Do you think that you can leverage sort of the, some of the game theory stuff in, in, in crypto to, uh, to not achieve scaling, but improve scaling, thinking about things like you know, the ability to limit uh, messages in the chat uh, to you know, people who have paid to be in that chat room? Um, you know, thinking a bit more far out here, but perhaps even uh, having uh, certain chat rooms or different chat rooms on different shards of Ethereum and, you know, in Ethereum 2.0, is, is that sort of part of the research too, or sort of thinking more in the long term and how, how, how a status can sort of spread across uh, the Ethereum uh, chain? So the Ethereum chain has nothing to do with the messaging protocol itself. 
And, and the way messaging works, it, it is already kind of sharded because a message doesn't have to hit every node. So, so there's, there is that already where it's like, we try to reduce the amount of people who receive certain messages that they don't need to, need to receive. The problem is that takes away darkness, right? Because then I know the route which a message took, so I know which parties are somewhat interested in it. We could probably get away from that, or we can probably enhance that when we later use something like a mixnet that adds darkness again, where we can then shard things a bit further or, or shard the layer on top a bit further. On top of that, um, which also speaks to your earlier question is like incentivization. Um, we would like to make it useful or like profitable for people to run nodes in their status network. As it, as it stands right now, like running a status node is based out of altruism. You're routing messages for people um, because they want to participate in the network or they want to help. Um, but if we can add that type of thing, then it becomes reasonable for that, that network to grow very quickly. And then engaging your own audience, say, as, like a, as, a, as a content creator, you can create incentivized channels at specific tiers based on participation. Um, one of the things that uh, I'm like, you, like, you can use NFTs and you know, proof of ownership of various certain things to give access to specific channels based on you know tiers of levels so you can then end up building your own patreon of some sort right you can do all kinds of things with that using crypto but uh speaking to what you said in terms of the chain that lives on you then have to make decisions on like what i guess value chain if you will stores those types of things for incentives and then make those decisions and i don't know how to like, like of course we're on ethereum now that's where everything is and that's the easiest way to build these types of systems quickly that will have any type of actual user base. What that looks like in the future, I, I can't say because the space moves and grows and changes so fast, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm interested to start experimenting with those things now that we are having user base grow and give us a lot of feedback on what they want. Because the longest time, without a user base, it's hard to know, you're, you're guessing. Now that we can kind of gradually and sustainably grow the ecosystem, they're gonna give us quality feedback on what they want and we can start really making sure that we like nail down giving it to them. Right. Okay. Uh, sorry, I neglected to realize that that, that there are, there are actually like status nodes oh, yeah. um, uh, that that uh, that make the the messaging app. Uh, I think that's a app, common yeah. that's a common thing. I, um, yeah. Maybe we don't broadcast it enough, but the status network in terms of the messaging layer is a, it's, it is its own network of nodes. Right. Anyone yeah. can build their own and point the status app to it. And then have their own private network of communication run run by run by Whisper or Waku is what the our our fork of Whisper is called, and and then we integrate various value chains like Ethereum as the kind of way to transact within the group of people who are communicating inside of it. Okay, um, tell me about some of the other products that um, that the that well products and tools that the status organization are is building. Uh, that are part of the status network that you're particularly excited about. I'm a big fan of keycard. Yeah, I like uh, keycard. Tell me, is cool. explain explain keycard to to our audience. So keycard is a, a hardware wallet that's pretty much a credit card. So um, it you got one. It, yeah, it it makes use of um, the new. I think it's called NFC, right? Oh, Corey. Cool. Thanks. I believe it's called NFC. Yeah, it uses it's a it's a Java card that also has a near field channel, which is NFC. So it's it's what you would normally think about when using a credit card. Um, and it's an open API in terms of uh, how we build the applet, which is the thing that lives inside of it. And that's George. You can have that. Thank you. Uh, that, so that's an old one. It's got a hardware bug. We're ordering new ones that no longer have a hardware bug. Basically, Sorry, give me the one with the hardware bug. It still works. <laughs> still works. But if you screw up the, the pairing process, you'll brick it. Uh, okay. Other than that, it works perfect. Uh, so how does but, this work? And so what that ends up being is it's a hardware wallet. Okay. It does everything that a hardware wallet does. It holds your keys. It signs things. Yeah. It holds the keys. Yeah. It holds the keys and signs them. And you have you have a lot of control. There's a uh, microcontroller on this? What? There's a microcontroller on mm -hmm. this? Which is powered by it's a secure element chip. So it's okay. a yeah, standard. Like it's it's the it's the highest standard of Java card you can have in terms of like banking infrastructure. Right. And then allows you to do, um, you know, when they say well, I think I forgot who it was the other day. They said we're the only we're the only company that uses a secure element. We are too. It's it's it, it is a it's 
high standard secure element Java card chip that can do uh, any of the EC cryptography that's relevant to the most popular chains, right? How much do these cost? I think the price point of those is around thirty dollars. I'm not. Okay. I can't speak to it right now. I forget. It's uh, definitely one of the cheapest hardware wallets. Well, it's what's there. nice about it, right? Yeah. That's a commoditized hardware with a yeah. tremendous amount of work behind it based on the <clears> banking <throat> industry. We just made an open source API that anyone can use. I think uh, there's, a, there's a couple other wallets that also implement it. You don't have to use status. Yeah. And the UX of it is great. So you just tap your card against your phone and you've signed a transaction. There's none of that like or, yeah. having to plug it into your computer and going on to my yeah. ether wallet or something and unlocking and selecting the account and blah 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 super simple and equally secure cool so you can use this also i guess to to, to store your um, like your status identity or so all identities and status are um derived from like hierarchical deterministic wallets right uh and so we have a branch uh from eip i think 1581 uh, which is a separate branch dedicated to non-wallet functionality that will probably be that will, that will use for any like identity level stuff, uh, and then all the other stuff and all that the master key lives on that and never leaves it. And so, but there's a, like it's also highly configurable. You can it's open source. Anyone can do it, and the applet is very small in terms of relative to the memory that's available on those things. So it can be it can live on alongside other Java card implementations for various activities. So you can use this for multiple wallets with multiple seed phrases or multiple keys uh, at the same time. And so like, we, I'm really excited about how that grows and what grows from its use in terms of people being able to manage keys more effectively at, like, and more cost effectively. Yeah, I mean, it's something like this, you, you can put in the hands of basically anyone, right? They're comfortable like, with that. They're, they're comfortable with it, and also the, the cost. Um, you know, like, hardware wallets are great, but, you know, at, at $50, $60, $100 or, or more uh, uh, price point, um, it, it, it's inaccessible for a lot of people around the world, I think. But also just the sort of the, the, the user experience interaction between, like, your app and also the wallet, it's, the hardware wallet itself is not super intuitive for most people. Whereas if with something like this, you know, all you're using is your mobile app and you just have to tap this thing when yeah. you're asked to confirm. Uh, Everyone who's used Apple Pay is easily able to use this card. That's cool. Um, interesting. Um, what are you guys most excited about in terms of um, the future of status and the status ecosystem? What else from you, Dean? I got a lot. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of interesting stuff we're working on right now. Uh, just that entire like looking at message scaling is there's super interesting work that's coming out with people we're collaborating with like the Nimtech guys who are like I had Harry in here veteran yesterday. yeah he like Claudia on his team she's like a veteran of Mixnet she's been working on it for 20 years so the stuff that comes out of like this entire like group of people who are working on messaging it's probably going to be super interesting what do you think of Elixir um Last time I checked, their docs weren't really open sourced or anything, yeah. so I don't know. It's kind of I'm gonna say this: uh, if you don't open source and are doing all these marketing claims, it's kind of vaporware. Yeah. You yeah. know, once 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 Elixir is released and out there, and we know how it actually works and can see how it works in practice, then there'll probably be a, a more fledged out opinion that I can give on it. Yeah, I mean, we we talked to David Chum a couple months ago, and. I mean, you know, it's David Chom, so there's obviously like lots to discuss with him. Uh, but we, we didn't really get into Elixir that much, um, mostly for this reason, because there's just so so little about it uh, that's been published. Uh, yeah. So based on like idea that like we're building infrastructure, and each individual part, like kind of team within the Status Network, is a different play. Like we're 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 working on every single level of the stack, if you will, between like new ways to connect computers together at like the base base layer with things like libp2p and nimbus and how to build those networks so they're very efficient specifically for mobile phones uh i look forward to having like useful nodes uh on phones and then you go up a layer and you have like the development like developer tooling so useful ways for people to build 
applications that are tailored towards their specific community or the product they're trying to build using the appropriate technology, right? So like, like you always learn about kind of developer frameworks that make it really, really easy and snappy to build something, but it's usually very opinionated in how you do it. I think like in products like Embark and Subspace allow you to pick and choose a lot of different technologies to get to the same in, in like product, uh, but provide a lot of really convenient ways to do it to make like the, like the process of building a good useful dApp better so that once you have those things, you can use status as a way to coordinate around them and like build those communities out and find new ways of like coordinating amongst each other. I'm really excited to see like the amount, like combination of all these things come together and what thrives from that and how people use it and build on it that we didn't see coming. I think that's, that's going to be fun. Also like usable cryptography. It's a big part of this is that if we want any type of real adoption and change towards like people's lives in terms of security and privacy, we got to make all this stuff much more usable. And that's abstracting things away like a key card to make it intuitive or, or the, the interface so that it feels like a chat application, but they're also sending value. Like all this stuff is required to come together to ac actually make a change. And I just, I'm curious to see how it goes. Great. Thanks. Thanks so much for being here today, guys. Thanks for Thank having you. us. Cheers.